chapters fifty seven through fifty nine of foul play by charles reed and dion boucicault this librivox recording is in the public domain fifty seven when joseph wiley disappeared from the scene nancy rouse made a discovery which very often follows the dismissal of a suitor that she was considerably more attached to him than she had thought the house became dull the subordinate washerwoman languid their taciturnity irritated and depressed nancy by turns in the midst of this michael penfold discovered that helen had come back safe he came into her parlour beaming with satisfaction and told her of the good news it gave her immense delight at first but when she had got used to her joy on that score she began to think she had used joe wiley very ill now that helen was saved she could no longer realize that wiley was so very much to blame she even persuaded herself that his disappearance was the act of a justly offended man and as he belonged to a class of whose good sense she had a poor opinion she was tormented with fears that he would do some desperate act drown himself or go to sea or worst of all marry some trollop she became very anxious and unhappy before this misfortune she used to go about singing the first verse of a song and whistling the next like any ploughboy an eccentric performance but it made the house gay now both song and whistle were suspended and instead it was all hard work and hard crying turn about she attached herself to michael penfold because he had known trouble and was sympathetic and these two opened their hearts to one another and formed a friendship that was very honest and touching the scene of their conversation and mutual consolation was nancy's parlour a little mite of a room she had partitioned off from her business for said she a lady i'll be after my work is done if it is only in a cupboard the room had a remarkably large fireplace which had originally warmed the whole floor but now was used as a ventilator only the gas would have been stifling without it as for lighting a fire in it that was out of the question on a certain evening soon after mr penfold's return from scotland the pair sat over their tea and the conversation fell on the missing sweetheart michael had been thinking it over and was full of encouragement he said miss rouse something tells me that if poor mr wiley could only know your heart he would turn up again directly what we ought to do is to send somebody to look for him in all the sailors haunts some sharp fellow dear me what a knocking they keep up next door oh that is always the way when one wants a quiet chat drat the woman i'll have her indicted no you won't miss rouse she is a poor soul and has got no business except letting lodgings she is not like you but i do hope she will be so kind as not to come quite through the wall dear heart said nancy go on and never mind her noise which it is worse than a horkin grinder well then if you can't find him that way i say advertise me cried nancy turning very red do i look like a woman as would advertise for a man no ma'am quite the reverse but what i mean is you might put in something not too plain for instance if j w will return to n r all will be forgotten and forgiven he'd have the upper hand of me for life said nancy no no i won't advertise for the fool what right had he to run off at the first word he ought to know my bark is worse than my bite by this time you can though me bite ma'am said the old gentleman bite no advertise since you're so fond of it come you sit down and write one and i'll pay for it for that matter michael sat down and drew up the following if mr joseph wiley will call on michael penfold at number three e c he will hear of something to his advantage to his advantage said nancy doubtfully why not tell him the truth why that is the truth ma'am isn't it to his advantage to be reconciled to an honest virtuous painstaking lady that honours him with her affection and me with her friendship besides it is the common form 
and there is nothing like sticking to form mr penfold said nancy any one can see you was born a gentleman and i am a deal prouder to have you and your washing than i should him as pays you your wages pale eyes pale hair pale eyebrows i wouldn't trust him to mangle a duster oh miss rouse pray don't disparage my good master to me i can't help it sir thought is free especially in this here compartment better speak one's mind than die o the sulks so shut your ear when my music jars but one every other day is enough if he won't come back for that why he must go and i must look out for another there's as good fish in the sea as ever came out of it still i'll not deny i have a great respect for poor joe oh mr penfold what shall i do oh 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 there there said michael i'll put this into the times every day you are a good soul mr penfold oh 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 when he had finished the advertisement in a clerkly hand and she had finished her cry she felt comparatively comfortable and favoured mr penfold with some reflections dear heart mr penfold how you and i do take to one another to be sure but so we ought for we are honest folk the pair and as has had a hard time don't it never strike you rather curious that two thousand pounds was at the bottom of both our troubles yourn and mine i might have married joe and been a happy woman with him but the devil puts in my head there you go again hammering life ain't worth having next door to that lodging house drat the woman if she must peck why don't she go in the churchyard and peck her own grave which we shall never be quiet till she is there and these here jim crack houses they won't stand no more pecking at than a soap sud ay that's what hurts me mr penfold the lord had given him and me health and strength and honesty our betters had wed for love and wrought for money as the saying is but i must go again nature that cried come couple and must bargain for two thousand pounds so now i've lost the man and not got the money nor never shall and if i had i'd burn oh. this tirade ended in stifled screams of terror caused by the sudden appearance of a human hand in a place and in a manner well adapted to shake the stoutest laundress's nerves this hand came through the brickwork of the chimney-place and there remained a moment or two then slowly retired and as it retired something was heard to fall upon the shavings and tinsel of the fireplace nancy by a feminine impulse put her hands before her face to hide this supernatural hand and when she found courage to withdraw them and glare at the place there was no aperture whatever in the brickwork and consequently the hand appeared to have traversed the solid material both coming and going oh mr penfold cried nancy i'm a sinful woman this comes of talking of the devil after sunset and she sat trembling so that the very floor shook mr penfold's nerves were not strong he and nancy both huddled together for mutual protection and their faces had not a vestige of colour left in them however after a period of general paralysis penfold whispered i heard it drop something on the shavings then we shall be all in a blaze of brimstone shrieked nancy wringing her hands and they waited to see then as no conflagration took place mr penfold got up and said he must go and see what it was the hand had dropped nancy in whom curiosity was beginning to battle with terror let him go to the fireplace without a word of objection and then cried out don't go anigh it sir it will do you a mischief don't touch it whatever take the tongs he took the tongs and presently flung into the middle of the room a small oilskin packet this as it lay on the ground they both eyed like two deer glowering at a piece of red cloth and ready to leap back over the moon if it should show signs of biting but oilskin is not preternatural nor has tradition connected it however remotely with the enemy of man consequently a great revulsion took place in nancy and she passed from fear to indignation at having been frightened so 
she ran to the fireplace and putting her head up the chimney screamed heave your dirt where you heave your love you brazen while she was objurgating her neighbour whom with feminine justice she held responsible for every act done in her house penfold undid the packet and nancy returned to her seat with her mind more at ease to examine the contents bank notes cried penfold ay said nancy incredulously they do look like bank notes and feel like em but they ain't wrote like them bank notes ain't wrote black like that in the left-hand corner penfold explained ten pound notes are not nor fives but large notes are these are all fifties fifty what's fifty pounds what each of them bits of paper worth fifty pounds yes let us count them one two three four oh lord twenty why that is two thousand pounds just two thousand pounds it is the very sum that ruined me it did not belong to me and its being in the house ruined my poor robert and this does not belong to you lock all the doors bar all the windows and burn them before the police come wait a bit said nancy wait a bit they sat on each side of the notes penfold agitated and terrified nancy confounded and perplexed fifty eight punctually at ten o'clock helen returned to frith street and found mr undercliff behind a sort of counter employed in tracing a workman was seated at some little distance from him both bent on their work mr undercliff said helen he rose and turned toward her politely a pale fair man with a keen grey eye and a pleasant voice and manner i am edward undercliff you come by appointment yes sir a question of handwriting not entirely sir do you remember giving witness in favour of a young clergyman mr robert penfold who was accused of forgery i remember the circumstance but not the details oh dear that is unfortunate said helen with a deep sigh she often had to sigh now why you see said the expert i am called on such a multitude of trials however i take notes of the principal ones what year was it in in eighteen sixty four mr undercliff went to a set of drawers arranged chronologically and found his notes directly it was a forged bill madam endorsed and presented by penfold i was called to prove that the bill was not in the handwriting of penfold here is my facsimile of the robert penfold endorsed upon the bill by the prisoner he handed it her and she examined it with interest and here are facsimiles of genuine writing by john wardlaw and here is a copy of the forged note he laid it on the table before her she started and eyed it with horror it was a long time before she could speak at length she said and that wicked piece of paper destroyed robert penfold not that piece of paper but the original this is a facsimile so far as the writing is concerned it was not necessary in this case to imitate paper and colour stay here is a sheet on which i have lithographed the three styles that will enable you to follow my comparison but perhaps that would not interest you helen had the tact to say it would thus encouraged the expert showed her that robert penfold's writing had nothing in common with the forged note he added i also detected in the forged note habits which were entirely absent from the true writing of john wardlaw you will understand there were plenty of undoubted specimens in court to go by then oh sir said helen robert penfold was not guilty certainly not of writing the forged note i swore that and i'll swear it again but when it came to questions whether he had passed the note and whether he knew it was forged that was quite out of my province i can understand that said helen but you heard the trial you are very intelligent sir you must have formed some opinion as to whether he was guilty or not the expert shook his head madam said he 
mine is a profound and difficult art which aims at certainties very early in my career i found that to master that art i must be single-minded and not allow my ear to influence my eye by purposely avoiding all reasoning from external circumstances i have distanced my competitors in expertise but i sometimes think i have rather weakened my powers of conjecture through disuse now if my mother had been at the trial she would have given you an opinion of some value on the outside facts but that is not my line if you feel sure he was innocent and want me to aid you you must get hold of the handwriting of every person who was likely to know old wardlaw's handwriting and so might have imitated it all the clerks in his office to begin with nail the forger that is your only chance what sir said helen with surprise if you saw the true handwriting of the person who wrote that forged note should you recognize it why not it is difficult but i have done it hundreds of times oh is forgery so common no but i am in all the cases and besides i do a great deal in a business that requires the same kind of expertise anonymous letters i detect assassins of that kind by the score a gentleman or lady down in the country gets a poisoned arrow by the post or perhaps a shower of them they are always in disguised handwriting those who receive them send them up to me with writings of all the people they suspect the disguise is generally more or less superficial five or six unconscious habits remain below it and often these undisguised habits are the true characteristics of the writer and i'll tell you something curious madam it is quite common for all the suspected people to be innocent and then i write back send me the handwriting of the people you suspect the least and among them i often find the assassin oh mr undercliff said helen you make my heart sick oh it is a vile world for that matter said the expert and the country no better than the town for all it looks so sweet with its green fields and purling rills there they sow anonymous letters like barley the very girls write anonymous letters that make my hair stand on end yes it is a vile world don't you believe him miss said mrs undercliff appearing suddenly then turning to her son how can you measure the world you live in a little one of your own a world of forgers and anonymous writers you see so many of these you fancy they are common as dirt but they are only common to you because they all come your way oh that is it is it said the expert doubtfully yes that is it ned said the old lady quietly then after a pause she said i want you to do your very best for this young lady i always do said the artist but how can i judge without materials and she brings me none mrs undercliff turned to helen and said have you brought him nothing at all no handwritings in your bag then helen sighed again i have no handwriting except mr penfold's but i have two printed reports of the trial printed reports said the expert they are no use to me ah here is an outline i took of the prisoner during the trial you can read faces tell the lady whether he was guilty or not and he handed the profile to his mother with an ironical look not that he doubted her proficiency in the rival art of reading faces but that he doubted the existence of the art mrs undercliff took the profile and colouring slightly said to miss rolleston it is living faces i profess to read there i can see the movement of the eyes and other things that my son here has not studied then she scrutinised the profile it is a very handsome face said she the expert chuckled there's a woman's judgment said he handsome the fellow i got transported for life down at exeter was an adonis and forged wills bonds and powers of attorney by the dozen there's something noble about this face said mrs undercliff ignoring the interruption and yet something simple i think him more likely to be a cat's paw than a felon having delivered this with a certain modest dignity she laid the profile on the counter before helen the expert had a wonderful eye and hand 
it was a good thing for society he had elected to be gamekeeper instead of poacher detector of forgery instead of forger no photograph was ever truer than this outline helen started and bowed her head over the sketch to conceal the strong and various emotions that swelled at the sight of the portrait of her martyr in vain if the eyes were hidden the tender bosom heaved the graceful body quivered and the tears fell fast upon the counter mrs undercliffe was womanly enough though she looked like the late lord thurlow in petticoats and she instantly aided the girl to hide her beating heart from the man though that man was her son she distracted his attention give me all your notes ned said she and let me see whether i can make something of them but first perhaps miss rolleston will empty her bag on the counter go back to your work a moment for i know you have enough to do the expert was secretly glad to be released from a case in which there were no materials and so helen escaped unobserved except by one of her own sex she saw directly what mrs undercliffe had done for her and lifted her sweet eyes thick with tears to thank her mrs undercliffe smiled maternally and next these two ladies did a stroke of business in the twinkling of an eye and without a word spoken whereof anon helen being once more composed mrs undercliffe took up the prayer-book and asked her with some curiosity what could be in that oh said helen only some writing of mr penfold mr undercliffe does not want to see that he is already sure robert penfold never wrote that wicked thing yes but i should like to see more of his handwriting for all that said the expert looking suddenly up but it is only in pencil never mind you need not fear i shall alter my opinion helen coloured high you are right and i should disgrace my good cause by withholding anything from your inspection there sir and she opened the prayer-book and laid cooper's dying words before the expert he glanced over them with an eye like a bird and compared them with his notes yes said he that is robert penfold's writing and i say again that hand never wrote the forged note let me see that said mrs undercliffe oh yes said helen rather irresolutely but you look into the things as well as the writing and i promised papa can't you trust me said mrs undercliffe turning suddenly cold and a little suspicious oh yes madam and indeed i have nothing to reproach myself with but my papa is anxious however i am sure you are my friend and all i ask is that you will never mention to a soul what you read there i promise that said the elder lady and instantly bent her black brows upon the writing and as she did so helen observed her countenance rise as a face is very apt to do when its owner enters on congenial work you would have made a great mistake to keep this from me said she gravely then she pondered profoundly then she turned to her son and said why edward this is the very young lady who was wrecked in the pacific ocean and cast on a desolate island we have all read about you in the papers miss and i felt for you for one but of course not as i do now i have seen you you must let me go into this with you ah if you would said helen oh madam i have gone through tortures already for want of somebody of my own sex to keep me in countenance oh if you could have seen how i have been received with what cold looks and sometimes with impertinent stares before i could even penetrate into the region of those cold looks and petty formalities any miserable straw was excuse enough to stop me on my errand of justice and mercy and gratitude gratitude oh yes madam the papers have only told you that i was shipwrecked and cast away they don't tell you that robert penfold warned me the ship was to be destroyed and i disbelieved and affronted him in return and he never reproached me not even by a look and we were in a boat with the sailors all starved not hungry starved and mad with thirst and yet in his own agony he hid something for me to eat all his thought all his fear was for me such things are not done in those great extremities of the poor vulgar suffering body except by angels in whom the soul rises above the flesh and he is such an angel i have had a knife lifted over me to kill me madam yes and again it was he who saved me 
i owe my life to him on the island over and over again and in return i have promised to give him back his honour that he values far more than life as all such noble spirits do ah my poor martyr how feebly i plead your cause oh help me pray pray help me all is so dark and i so weak so weak again the loving eyes streamed and this time not an eye was dry in the little shop the expert flung down his tracing with something between a groan and a curse who can do that drudgery he cried while the poor young lady mother you take it in hand find me some material though it is no bigger than a fly's foot give me but a clue no thicker than a spider's web and i'll follow it through the whole labyrinth but you see i'm impotent there's no basis for me it is a case for you it wants a shrewd sagacious body that can read facts and faces and i won't jest any more miss rolleston for you are deeply in earnest well then she really is a woman with a wonderful insight into facts and faces she has got a way of reading them as i read handwriting and she must have taken a great fancy to you for as a rule she never does us the honour to meddle have you taken a fancy to me madam said helen modestly and tenderly yet half archly that i have said the other those eyes of yours went straight into my heart last night or i should not be here this morning that is partly owing to my own eyes being so dark and yours the loveliest hazel it is twenty years since eyes like yours have gazed into mine diamonds are not half so rare nor a tenth part so lovely to my fancy she turned her head away melted probably by some tender reminiscence it was only for a moment she turned round again and said quietly yes ned i should like to try what i can do i think you said these are reports of his trial i'll begin by reading them she read them both very slowly and carefully and her face grew like a judge's and helen watched each shade of expression with deep anxiety that powerful countenance showed alacrity and hope at first then doubt and difficulty and at last dejection helen's heart turned cold and for the first time she began to despair for now a shrewd person with a plain prejudice in her favour and robert's was staggered by the simple facts of the trial fifty nine mrs undercliffe having read the reports avoided helen's eye another bad sign she turned to mr undercliffe and probably because the perusal of the reports had disappointed her she said almost angrily edward what did you say to make them laugh at that trial both these papers say that an expert was called whose ingenuity made the court smile but did not counterbalance the evidence why that is a falsehood on the face of it said the expert turning red i was called simply and solely to prove penfold did not write the forged note i proved it to the judge's satisfaction and he directed the prisoner to be acquitted on that count miss rolleston the lawyers often do sneer at experts but then four experts out of five are rank impostors a set of theorists who go by arbitrary rules framed in the closet and not by large and laborious comparison with indisputable documents these charlatans are not aware that five thousand cramped and tremulous but genuine signatures are written every day by honest men and so they denounce every cramped or tremulous writing as a forgery the varieties in a man's writing caused by his writing with his glove on or off with a quill or a bad steel pen drunk or sober calm or agitated in full daylight or dusk etc etc all this is a dead letter to them and they have a bias towards suspicion of forgery and a banker's clerk with his mere general impression is better evidence than they are but i am an artist of a very different stamp i never reason a priori i compare and i have no bias i never will have the judges know this and the pains and labour i take to be right and they treat me with courtesy at penfold's trial the matter was easy i showed the court he had not written the note and my evidence crushed the indictment so far how could they have laughed at my testimony why they acted upon it 
those reports are not worth a straw what journals were they cut out of i don't know said helen is there nothing on the upper margin to show no what not on either of them no show them me please this is a respectable paper too the daily news oh mr undercliff how can you know that i don't know it but i think so because the type and paper are like that journal the conductors are fond of clean type so am i why here is another misstatement the judge never said he aggravated his offence by trying to cast a slur upon the ward laws i'll swear the judge never said a syllable of the kind what he said was you can speak in arrest of judgment on grounds of law but you must not impugn the verdict with facts that was the only time he spoke to the prisoner at all these reports are not worth a button helen lifted up her hands and eyes in despair where shall i find the truth said she the world is a quicksand my dear young lady said mrs undercliff don't you be discouraged there must be a correct report in some paper or other i am not so sure of that said undercliff i believe the reporters trundle off to the nearest public-house together and light their pipes with their notes and settle something or other by memory indeed they have reached a pitch of inaccuracy that could not be attained without cooperation independent liars contradict each other but these chaps follow one another in falsehood like geese toddling after one another across a common come come said mrs undercliff if you can't help us don't hurt us we don't want a man to talk yellow jaundice to us miss rolleston must employ somebody to read all the other papers and compare the reports with these i'll employ nobody but myself said helen i'll go to the british museum directly the museum cried mr undercliff looking with surprise why they will be half an hour groping for a copy of the times no no go to peel's coffee-house he directed her where to find the place and she was so eager to do something for robert however small that she took up her bag directly and put up the prayer-book and was going to ask for her extracts when she observed mr undercliff was scrutinizing them with great interest so she thought she would leave them with him but on looking more closely she found that he was examining not the reports but the advertisements and miscellany on the reverse side she waited out of politeness but she coloured and bit her lip she could not help feeling hurt and indignant any trash is more interesting to people than poor robert's case she thought and at last she said bitterly those advertisements seem to interest you sir shall i leave them with you if you please said the expert over whose head bent in dogged scrutiny this small thunderbolt of feminine wrath passed unconscious helen drove to peel's coffee-house mrs undercliff pondered over the facts that had been elicited in this conversation the expert remained absorbed in the advertisements at the back of helen's reports when he had examined every one of them minutely he held the entire extracts up to the light and looked through them then he stuck a double magnifier in his eye and looked through them with that then he took two pieces of card wrote on them re penfold and looked about for his other materials to put them all neatly together lo the profile of robert penfold was gone now that is too bad said he so much for her dove-like eyes that you admired so miss innocence has stolen that profile stolen she bought it of me why she never said a word no but she looked a look she asked me with those sweet imploring eyes might she have it and i looked yes then she glanced toward you and put down a note here it is why you beat the telegraph you two ten pounds for that thing i must make it up to her somehow i wish you could poor girl she is a lady every inch but she is in love with that penfold i'm afraid it is a hopeless case i have seen a plainer but hopeless it is not however you work your way and i'll work mine but you can't you have no materials no but i have found a door that may lead to materials 
having delivered himself thus mysteriously he shut himself up in obstinate silence until helen rolleston called again two days afterward she brought a bag full of manuscript this time to wit copies in her own handwriting of eight reports the queen versus penfold she was in good spirits and told mrs undercliff that all the reports were somewhat more favourable than the two she had left and she was beginning to tell mr undercliff he was quite right in his recollection when he interrupted her and said all that is secondary now have you any objection to answer me a question she coloured but said oh no ask me anything you like then she blushed deeper how did you become possessed of those two reports you left with me the other day at this question so different from what she feared helen cleared up and smiled and said from a mr hand a clerk in mr wardlaw's office they were sent me at my request the expert seemed pleased at this reply his brow cleared and he said then i don't mind telling you that those two reports will bring penfold's case within my province to speak plainly miss rolleston your newspaper extracts are forgeries End of chapters fifty seven through fifty nine